All right, everybody, continuing right along in my mini series on helping you all get ready for clinical. And my new clinical guide will follow with um, all this information kind of neatly wrapped up tight for you guys um, because ultimately I want you to walk into that first week of clinical and I want you to be way better, way stronger than I was. Plus, all the stuff that I'm talking about is going to come back and get you for board. So, got to know it no matter what. So, thermoregulation. We're going to talk about um, your new best friend, which is going to be Celsius. So, just so you know, Fahrenheit is gone. Celsius is going to be what you need to know. Um, so I'm going to go over the ways that our patients lose heat in the operating room, what the effects are, so you know why it is so important for you to keep your patients warm. Now, really quick, now being cold is good in certain um you know, certain situations where you want hypothermia, that would be, um, you know, actually for strokes, cerebral aneurysm clipping, um, cardiac arrest, obviously we, we cool them off, uh, going on bypass, aortic cross clamping, um, uh, sometimes for carotid endarterectomies as well, um, because actually um, oxygen consumption um, decreases at like about five to 7% for every loss of degree of Celsius there. So, not going to get into all that today, but do know that there are instances where we do want our patients to be cold. For the most part, we do not. All right. So, hypothalamus. Your hypothalamus and your brainstem is what control the temps, right? And the body is going to regulate temp between 36.7 and I believe 37.1 degrees Celsius. All right. But we put patients under anesthesia, guess what happens? We put everything to sleep. We put their brain to sleep. So they are not really able um, to manage their temperature as they would when they're awake and moving around and their body's functioning normal because they are asleep and their brain is asleep, okay? Other things that um, we lose heat in the operating room um, are drugs, vasodilation, right? We lose a lot of the drugs, propofol, um, volatiles, a lot of the drugs are vasodilating, so we lose heat that way. Um, I had just said our, our hypothalamus actually recalibrates their set point when they're under anesthesia, doesn't function as well. Um, not able to shiver. Are they, you know, patients are under general anesthesia, um, maybe they even have a block or something, they're not going to be able to shiver and generate heat. Um, the operating rooms are freezing because the surgeons are usually sweating under the lights and working. The table is freezing. Room temperature IV fluids, cold blood products, all of that stuff is going to contribute to your patients being cold. Plus, any type of anesthetic, you get redistribution of heat from central to peripheral, all right? And we already said that we, you know, prevent shivering and it impairs thermoregulation in your hypothalamus, all right? So what are the four ways, I know the board's like this, um, that uh, patients lose heat, the four kind of overall ways. Radiation, right? So radiation, we lose a lot of our heat through our skin. So make sure to get them covered up with warm blankets. Usually it's that part where the nurse is likely to get in the room and the nurse is like throwing the warm blankets on. And I'm like, I just want to get my monitors on. Anybody experience that? <laughs> Um, the second one is convection. So that's like a wind chill. That's that airflow, like they go in the OR and the patients are like, oh my gosh, it's cold. And I'm like, yeah, I know I'm freezing. Third one is evaporation. So some type of water loss. So respiration, if you look in your circuit, they're losing, um, they're losing fluids from respiration. Obviously these patients are open. If you've gone from laparoscopic to an open procedure, or you got a big hip or something like that, you know, big hip in incision, right? They're losing a lot of, um, of fluids, water heat, all that good stuff from that. And then conduction. So touching cold objects, getting onto the OR table, putting cold IV fluids or room temperature IV fluids in. Um, the surgeons are irrigating. Sometimes they do warm the fluids, sometimes they're not, um, but it does help when they do. So those are the four top ways or the four only ways that those patients are basically losing heat that I want you to be um, cognizant of because, you know, get warm IV fluids, use the warmer if it's going to be like a longer case or you're getting blood, um, bear huggers, put the bear hugger on them. I'm a huge person. I wrap... Um, um, for like for mat cases or stuff like that, I wrap, you know, blankets around their head and really like tuck them in tight, you know, whatever you can do to try to um, decrease their um, being cold. Because what happens is, is shivering, first of all, if they get out, they're freezing, they wake up, they're shaking, what's going to happen is that it actually increases your oxygen consumption like 400 to 500%. And for patients with coronary artery disease and other type of issues, 
you're gonna increase their MI risk, right? We just got out of surgery, they just went under major stress, and now they're like shaking and we're increasing their oxygen consumption. So no good. Treatments for that include Demerol, which is probably used most often, but you can also use Clonidine and Presidex. Um, another thing is you get a lot of SNS stimulation with being cold. We've already stimulated them. We Our whole job is to like decrease the stress. <laughs> so um, not good um, when these patients are cold. Your oxyhemoglobin curve is gonna ship shift to the left, you get a decreased tissue oxygenation from vasoconstriction because you're, you know, you're constricting up. Okay. So left shift to the hemoglobin curve, um, increased risk of coagula coagulopathy, clots, platelet dysfunction. Um, you could have some for sickle cell patients, absolutely cannot have them cold. You can cause sickling of the hemoglobin S. Um, it'll actually, being cold will decrease your drug, drug metabolism, so they're going to hold on to drugs longer, hold on to your anesthetic longer. Um, and we had said increased risk of MI, increased risk of any type of arrhythmias, decreased oxygen available to tissues, increased surgical side infection risk when they're cold, um, increased EBL risk, we said prolonged emergence, prolonged neurobuscular blockers, all the things, all right? So point is... Keep your patients warm. Sometimes you even need to throw a bear hugger on them in PACU, especially the little ones. Um, if you're in the pre-op room and they're already cold, you have this little old lady, try to maybe put a bear hugger on her if you have them pre-op, pre you know, warm, um, you know, get some warm blankets on or around their head, you know, before you get into the room. Um, sometimes with pediatric patients, I will put the bear hugger on the bed and I will warm the bed before they get there. You can also do that as well as they're coming in the room so they get on a nice warm bed <laughs> or something like that. Um, and then try to use warm IV v fluids. Hopefully your place will have a place where you can grab IV fluids that are warm. Um, use the warmer, use the bear hugger, wrap their head, all the good stuff. Okay. All right. I hope that was helpful. Um, happy keeping your patients warm because you are the one that put their hypothalamus to sleep. So you are the one that is responsible for keeping them nice and warm interop as best you can. And also nudge the surgeon to use warm fluids, but usually they're pretty good about that as well. So, all right, you guys, I will see you on the next one. Have an awesome, awesome day.